Hello, I'm Deanna. And I'm Kaylee. Welcome, Welcome to Creekside. Hey dads, there's still time to sign up for the father-daughter campout trip. This is a great way to make memories with your daughter. The campout is next weekend, June 3rd through the 5th, and registration closes on June 1st. Sign up today on our website. Women of Creekside, join us for a time of worship, prayer and testimony by the fire on Fridays, June 24th, July 22nd, and August 26th at 7.30 in the back parking lot. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner, June 27th through July 1st. The theme this year is 80s. How rad is that? Totally 80s, kids will hear stories from the book of Acts and learn how God's spirit worked in and through the early believers. They'll discover that they too have been empowered to take the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Registration is open now through our website. Looking to grow your faith? Summer courses at Creekside University take you to the next step in your walk with Jesus. Classes are starting Tuesdays, June 14th. The classes you can choose from are Understanding Christian Community, a Biblical Model Boundaries in Marriage, Understanding the Choices that Make or Break Loving Relationships Tactics, a Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions Every Tribe, Nation, and Tongue, a Biblical Theology for Biblical Unity Registration is open now. Visit our website to sign up. The annual business meeting is next month, Sunday, June 12th at 1 p.m. in the venue. We hope this is already on your calendar. You don't want to miss this. If this is your first time joining us online, we would love to call you and say hello. Text the word guest to 888-111 and someone will contact you. If you need prayer, you can text the word Dean Prayer to 888-111 and someone will reach out to pray with you. We are so grateful for everyone who gives to Creekside and the ministry it allows us to do. If you want to give to Creekside, you can text the word GIVE to the number here on the screen, or you can conveniently give through our app on the website. Let's worship together. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, He parted the raging sea, my God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise We shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals we sing to the God who saves We sing to the God who always makes a way Cause He hung up on that cross Then He rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away Yeah! There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise We were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoners Now we're running free we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise, yeah! There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today 
And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet We shout out your praise 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 So we were, uh, just before we recorded uh, this, we were gathering as a team and just praying and talking about the heavy things that are happening in our world right now. And maybe there's heavy things happening in your life and certainly in our country and around the world. And we're just kind of feeling that heaviness and, and bringing it and some people within our team and just, we're just bringing it to the Lord, you know, and, and, and just praying. And uh, I was reminded of this uh, scripture in Isaiah where God, is Isaiah 43 and, and God's talking to us. He was talking to Israel and, and he's talking to us through the centuries. And there had been all this trouble and drama and, and he said, forget that. Don't focus on that. Focus on what I'm doing. This is verse 19 in Isaiah 43. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And then this part, and we're going to sing about this here in a moment. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. He is the God who makes a way. And we're going to sing that even when we can't see it sometimes. He is working in the background. He is our God, the way maker. Can we just lift our voices to him and let's sing together.
feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, yes, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, You know, I remember preaching in December of 2012, right after Sandy Hook, and saying 20 six and seven year old kids were gunned down. And saying at that time, I have a six and a seven year old, and I can't even imagine. Now, here I am preaching in 2022, and 19 kids between the ages of eight and 10 full of life, excited for their last days of school, were gunned down. And there I am standing and I have a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old. And still, I can't even imagine. Now, yes, we needed to pray for the families and communities of Uvalde, Texas. We need to pray for our teachers and students nationwide and here in Elk Grove who should have no reason to fear going to school and learning with their friends. And yes, the transforming power of Jesus is the only thing that will bring change. But if I can be honest for a second, I'm tired of the endless promises of thoughts and prayers. I'm tired of the endless gun debates. I want to see the church rise up and make a difference in the lives of children and families. What if the church rose up and business leaders, doctors, lawyers uh, decided to, to get their subbing credentials to support our schools and children? What if the church rose up to fill roles as coaches, mentors, counselors? so that we who are filled with the Spirit of God could reach out to the outcasts, the broken, the hurting, and bring them the love of God. You could volunteer in Creekside's own student and children's ministries. Church, let's not just talk, not just post. Let's get in the game and make a difference in people's lives. Will you pray with me? God, we do lift up these hurting families in the community of Uvalde. You bring comfort and healing that we can't understand. So we pray for kids and families nationwide that we would return to you, that we would comprehend the depths of your love for us and show that love to others. God, raise up your church to step out in confidence and faith to do hard things. To step out with fear, without fear, to radically love this community that you've placed us in. 
we humbly confess our sinfulness and declare our need for you in our own hearts, in our families, in our community, and in the world. Amen. Now for a story on the lighter side. My senior year of college, I, I was an RA, a residence assistant, which means it was my job to make sure that the incoming 18-year-old freshmen were able to stay out of trouble, make it to class on time, and just generally navigate not living with mom and dad anymore. Now, one of the guys on my floor, uh, he was a backup hockey goalie uh, for the school's hockey team, and he was built like a wall, neck the same size as his head, just built solid. And one day he comes up to me and says, hey, hey, Joel, is it okay if I cover my whole body with Vaseline? And then I'm going to run down the hall really fast. And with all the Vaseline, I'm just going to slide down the hall like a slip and slide. And it's going to be awesome. And I paused and I thought about my responsibility to these freshmen and to their parents who I said, don't worry. I'll watch out for your boys. And then I thought, this sounds both stupid and awesome at the same time, which is one of my favorite combinations. So I asked him just one question. Will you clean it up afterwards? He said yes. I said yes. So we planned the night. Every guy on the floor was there. The guys from the, the other floors, they had come up to watch the activities too. In fact, I looked out the window and there was a large group of girls gathered down below trying to catch a glimpse of the action. It felt like the whole school had heard about this event and wanted to witness the Vaseline covered sliding backup hockey goalie. So he shows up, he's got his, his hockey mask, boxers, Nothing else except for covered head to toe with Vaseline. Everyone's cheering. Everyone's pumped up. He starts running as fast as he can. He's about to get to my door where he's going to start the slide. And he jumps up in the air, perfectly laid out. And then thump goes nowhere. I look down at him and I say one thing, clean it up. And I walk back into my room. So why do I tell that story? One, it's a lot of fun. Two, the next morning it's cleaned up-ish. So I knocked on the door because I wanted to ask him to clean it up a little bit more. But he doesn't answer. So I head off to class. I come back and knock again. No answer. I didn't see him all day. In fact, I didn't see him for multiple days. When I'd heard he missed a hockey game, I knew something was wrong. So this time I, I don't stop knocking until he finally answers and he comes out and it turns out he was so embarrassed by his failure that he didn't even want to show his face. He didn't want to face the rejection of his friends and those who were there to witness his epic fail. His failure and fear of rejection took him out of the game. And failure and fear and rejection, it takes us out of the game too. And that's our topic of the day. We're going to talk about the fear of failure and rejection. And this is so important because it's a, a very common and deeply rooted fear that's not always easily seen. And the fear of failure can send you into hiding. It can take you out of the game. And it's something that we can easily mask. So we don't always readily see it. In fact, one of the smartest people I know, their dad told them when they were growing up that they had poop for brains, except for they used a different word. I'm sure you can imagine what the word was. They'd come home with a 97% on a calculus final. And their dad would ask, where's the other 3%? And he wasn't joking. Now, I joke around with my kids, but this dad was like, no, really, where's the 3%? He would sit down with him until they got everything right. And my friend, they, they grew up, they spent all of their time performing, just trying to please other people when they were really trying to please their dad. Every person they met became their dad. On the outside, they looked very successful. 
but on the inside, they felt like they were never good enough. So they continued to strive and to succeed and to please others. In the meantime, they had no time for their own family, no time for serving in the church. The games that were important, they were taken out of those games because they had to please somebody who had unrealistic expectations. Personally, I can have an unhealthy fear of rejection. Now, I'm not concerned about my accomplishments. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who could have a to-do list 10% done and feel very content in myself. It drives my wife, my wife crazy, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm more concerned about relationships. I desperately have a need for people to like me, which in my unhealthy moments can cause me to do one of two things. One, I I do things I don't want to do or give promises I can't even keep because I don't want to let you down. Or two, I just go inward and don't have relationships at all because it's just too emotionally, physically, and mentally hard. And then when I really spiral, I have a hard time believing that people even like me at all. Like just the other day, someone came up to me and said like, hey, I just realized who you are. I have a friend who goes to Creekside and they were telling me that you preached the best sermon that they'd ever heard. And in my head, I was like, what? I really didn't even think that person liked me. And then I felt the pressure of, what if my next sermon isn't as good as the last one? Will they still like me? So I have this deep-rooted fear of failure and rejection myself. And I could let my fear and failure, my fear of failure and rejection take me out of the game. But here I am. Because I have done and continually do a lot of soul work. And I strive to let God speak to me and define who I am, my identity. And I don't allow man to do it. God speaks to us that our purpose and our worth is found in Him. I have a mantra I say again and again to remind me of those truths. I wouldn't be surprised if you heard me say it before. I say, I am Joel, in whom God dwells and delights, and I live in the unshakable kingdom of God. And you see in your notes, I left a blank there for you. And I want you just to write your own name in there to say, I am whoever you are in whom God dwells and delights and I live in the unshakable kingdom of God. And the God who dwells in me and is delighted about everything that I am and who promises his unshakable kingdom tells me and tells you in Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Failure and rejection. It's all just fear. And fear is a liar. Fear is false evidence appearing real. It's a lie. Don't fall for the lie. Don't fall for the effects of the lie that was spoken in the beginning when the serpent said to Eve in Genesis 3, 4, you will not certainly die. Right? Do you remember that? He said, you will not certainly die. You can know more than God. You can be like God. Remember, they take the fruit, they steal a bite. And what is the first thing they do? They feel shame. When their eyes are opened, they feel shame. Genesis 3, 7, they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. We feel the sinful effects of that shame to this day. We fear rejection and failure, and we continue to sew those fig leaves together, trying to clothe ourselves. We sew fig leaves to hide behind our humor, fig leaves hiding behind our accomplishments, Fig leaves, we become people pleasers. We isolate anything to hide the shame. But we are created 
in the image of God. God extends to us his grace, the forgiveness of sins. He was worthy to take away all of our sins and he passes that worth on to us. He gives us a purpose. When we hide, when we try to sew our our own clothing out of fig leaves, instead of calling fear a liar, we call God a liar. We say the sacrifice of his son was not enough. Jesus came so that we could know God. He came to show us that we are unconditionally loved and empowered to build his kingdom. The key to fighting the fear of failure and rejection is to know and continually be reminded of our purpose and our worth, that Jesus gives to us. So let's take a look at two people that Jesus intimately knew and interacted with here on earth as he helped them turn away from their fears and focus on what is important. The first is Simon Peter as he finds his purpose. If you remember, Peter uh, gets called by Jesus. He's fishing. He says he drops everything to follow Jesus, to become a fisher of men. He is one of Jesus' strongest disciples. But in Luke 22, Jesus looks at Peter in the upper room and he says this. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. So now we move forward, just 20 verses. Then seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looks over and she looks at him closely and says, Hey, hey, that man, he was with him. But he denies it, says, Woman, I don't know him. Then a little later, someone else sees him and says, no, you you also, you you were one of them. Said, man, I am not, he replied. And then about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he is a Galilean. And Peter replies, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And just as he was speaking, he hears that rooster crow. Exactly what Jesus said would happen. And it says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered those words. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter is broken. He has failed Jesus. He has rejected Jesus. He and the disciples go into hiding ashamed, but Jesus raises from the dead three days later, victorious, and appears to the disciples, appears to Peter. And three times, John chapter 21, he asked Peter, do you love me? So they finished eating, which is, that's just cool. Jesus raised from the dead, eating with the disciples. And he comes to Peter, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, well, feed my lambs. And then again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. And Jesus says, well, then take care of my sheep. And then a third time he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And now Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. 
Jesus reinstates Peter, gives him a purpose, forgives his sin, forgives the failure, forgives the rejection. It's all gone. It just says, feed his sheep. Now imagine Peter's thinking, you know, God, you know all things. You know all things. You know I failed you miserably. I saw your face when you looked at me and I was broken. I I was humbled. I wept bitterly at what I did to you. And yet here you are calling me to your service. How can this be that you would forgive me? You know everything. You know how much I love you. And Jesus just simply says, get back in the game. Don't let your shame, don't let your failure sideline you. You are Peter, you are Petros, you are the rock on which the church will be built. And Jesus looks at you and all of your fear, all of your failure, all of your rejection, all of your shame, and he says, don't let your fear or failure sideline you. You've been filled by the Spirit of God to be His love and light here on earth. Everything is forgiven. Go and live for God. That is your purpose. Remind yourself of it daily. Next, I'm going to look at the story of Mary and Martha as Martha discovers her true worth. Look at me here in Luke 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to help me. You see, Martha had her identity wrapped up, her worth wrapped up and found in being known as a person that gets stuff done. Housekeeper, cook, host. She's the performer who wants to be known for what she is doing and accomplishing. Her desire is to be noticed and appreciated. So she calls out her sister because that's always an easy thing to do, right? I'm going to blame somebody else. I'm going to make somebody else look bad. It's like Adam and Eve at the beginning. No, the, the, the woman made me do it. No, the serpent made me do it. Right? She calls out her sister, makes her look bad. She's like, look, Jesus, all the things that I'm doing. And there's my sister. She's not doing anything. So essentially she's saying, Jesus, notice me for my accomplishments. Tell me that I'm worthy. Tell me that I have worth in my serving you and all these people. And he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying or what Jesus isn't saying. Jesus isn't saying, Martha, Mary is better than you. Mary has her own faults. We all have our faults. He's simply saying, Martha, you worried about all the things that don't make me love you any more or any less. Mary in this moment is choosing what is better. You see, Martha, That which brings you worth and value is sitting in your house at this very moment. He's present with you. Find your worth in the God who loves you. You are defining your own success, your own value, and I just want you to know me to love me, to be loved by me. This is the greatest identity and value that you will ever know. I loved you and knew you before you were even formed. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And we see that in Psalm 139. I just, it's one of my favorite Psalms. 
It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame is not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Can you imagine that? Think about the sand on a beach. When I awake, I am still with you. We have to watch out for the trappings of defining ourselves by cultural values and not seeing ourselves in the view of God's love for us. Did you know there's a culture where having a long neck is a sign of beauty? Women literally add rings on their neck to elongate it. It's simply cultural. People from the outside looking in think, you're crazy. Why would you deform your body like that? Did you know there's another culture where the size of your house or the car you drive or the amount of money in your bank account and a, and a flat stomach with rock hard abs is a sign of status? Crazy, right? What a crazy culture that is. <laughs> Obviously it's us, but again, it, it's just cultural. And honestly, it's the opposite of God's kingdom living. Everyone in God's kingdom is a little chubby. No, just kidding. But look at this in Matthew 19, 23. And then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Our American culture elevates worth of individuals based on economic value and not the spiritual value. And God who says, you are worthy because you're my kid and I love you. And that's it. Some of you are falling for it and it's having an impact. It's cultural. It's just rings around your neck. We let the craziest things define us. And the God who spoke creation into being is crying out to us, just be the you I created you to be. And find your worth by sitting at my feet and find your purpose by feeding my sheep. When we don't match the world standards that's when failure and rejection, shame and blame enter our lives. That's when we start sowing the fig leaves again and again just to have them fall apart again and again. Now, God's standards were so high that he sent his son to the world to die for our sin and shame. He faced rejection and death so that we can live confidently loved fully alive. We can hardly reach the American standards of success. We can never reach the success that God has set apart for perfection, except for that he came and he loved us so much and he just gave it to us. You live fully loved, confidently loved, fully alive because of Christ. He clothes us in his righteousness. I'm going to go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. He knew the fig leaves wouldn't last. And he makes a sacrifice of his beloved creation, a, a, an animal of some kind, to cover us. Knew that we would need more of a covering than just the fig leaves. Then fast forward, and it's really just this beautiful picture of him sending his son, his beloved son, to sacrifice himself for 
us so that we would be free from sin and shame. As John 3, 16 so clearly and beautifully says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And it's not just the live forever part that matters. God calls us to live life in the fullest. We don't live eternally someday. We're living eternally now. We're called to live in fullness of life because of what Christ has done for us and his love for us now. John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. The fear or the the false evidence uh, appearing real, the, oh, you won't surely die if you eat the fruit. It's all a lie. It's all a lie to steal, kill, and destroy. The truth is Jesus who loved you so much, he gave himself for you that you might live fully that you might find your worth sitting in worship at his feet, that you may be called to a purpose of bringing his kingdom here. God cares about you and wants you to get into the game. Look at this beautiful passage in Matthew 6. Jesus is saying this to us. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying or fearing add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Why do you fear about how you're perceived? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If he dresses the lilies with a beauty and splendor, how much more? Will he clothe you? If he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love you? Pastor Andrew Pack said to me the other day, if there was one thing that I wish people could know, that if I could just impart one bit of wisdom just automatically into people's hearts, heads and minds and souls, it would be that they would know how much God loves them. And I agree. I see too many people defined by fear and not faith, wasting so much time masking and avoiding their failures simply because they're trying to find love. And the love of God was already given to us. And these failures, they consume and condition us. But let me leave you with this verse from Galatians. So you will know what God has called you to do. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Don't feed the lies of this world. Get in the game, the game that matters. And repeat to yourself again and again, may you know whoever you are, and you can fill your name in the blank here. But for me, I am Joel, in whom Christ dwells and delights. And I live in the unshakable kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? God, would you speak to us again and again, just lavish your love over us again and again, that we would come to know and firmly believe that we are who you say we are, that we can live firmly and confidently in your love, that we can reject rejection. We can say, failure, you failed. Because the love of God and his purpose for my life has permeated all that I am. God, may we live for you and bring your kingdom and your glory here. We are who you say we are. In your name we pray. 
Amen. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me and know His love for me. Oh, His love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free, always oh, free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed His grace to run. A slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died. 